any computing unit that you look at will have hardwares and softwares. So we're going to look at computer systems, hardwares and softwares. So first, let's look at hardwares. So main hardware component categories. So it doesn't matter if it if, if the computing unit is a phone or a microwave or a camera, they all have these hardware components if it if it has a computing unit in it. One is the central processing unit, main memory, secondary memory, input devices, output devices. Now let's put all of these together and see an overall picture. Here we have all of those in this figure. Here we have all the input devices. In the left hand side, on the right hand side, we have some output devices. These are not all of the input devices, you know, there can be more. But here I have some common input and output devices. Um, so, if you were to take my introduction to computing class, we went through these in details. So here, like a scanner, keyboard, these provide some input into your computer. You can see your output through a screen or a printer or a speaker. A speaker you hear sound so output produced by the computer goes into the speaker and you hear the sound. In middle I have other hardware components. Here I have the secondary storage device, your hard, hard drive. That's where you save everything like if you were to save an essay if you were to uh, install a video game, all of those goes in here. Whenever you double click on an icon to open up a video game, all those data will get transferred into this memory card. Here's your main memory. So all the ones and zeros get transferred here. So this is very fast. So after that, like let's say your character move through the uh, through the game then this central processing unit has to do some calculations and move your character or if you type in uh, essay some word the CPU has to do some calculations and convert things between ASCII and show that into the screen so with me uh, memory card and Central processing unit is going, going to have some back and forth communication going on. Very fast back and forth communications. I think all of you is clear with what is an input device, something you provide information, what is an output device. Now, uh, let's look at, look at this CPU uh, in details. Then we'll go into memory, then secondary storage. Here, we have something called ENIAC computer. This is basically a one big CPU, central processing unit. So even though this is huge, it's much slower. They came up with this ENIAC computer long time ago. So it's very slow. Nowadays, our modern CPU is much smaller. This is a modern central processing unit also known as microprocessor. It can fit in your palm and it's much faster than that ENIAC machine. Now let's see the inside of this uh, CPU. So if you look at the inside of that CPU, it has two main parts to that, main parts to it. One is called the arithmetic and logic unit, other one is the control unit. So to that CPU, the one you saw in the hand of this person, input coming in, then output goes out. So input coming in, some ones and zeros, so this is supposed to do some uh, things with it, then produce some outputs. So this control unit is the one that coordinates all of the computer's operation. So this right here coordinate things. 
this part up here it does all the calculations the arithmetic and logic unit designed to perform mathematical operations so here I put some description the CPU is comprised of two things control unit this one and arithmetic and logic unit so this one right here so the control unit retrieve and decode programs instructions coordinate activities of all other parts of the computer that's what the control unit does arithmetic and logic unit it's hardware optimized for high speed numeric calculation hardware designed to true true false yes no decisions meaning is supposed to do some calculations and produce bunch of ones and zeros we already looked at input devices output devices and central processing unit now let's look at main memory we are going to look at this part right here main memory whenever you have a program running on your in your computer all those data related to that program that you are running will be in this main memory so this main memory is known as volatile meaning it doesn't retain all those data if the power is lost so for example if someone come and unplug your computer you lose all the data that you didn't save like if you were playing a video game like let's say someone come and unplug it all those data is gone so all the points you earn during the game is gone if you had an unsaved document that data will be gone because main memory is volatile all those data all those ones and zeros in main memory will be lost main memory is erased when a program terminates or the computer is turned off so that's what it's saying so it's volatile that's the main thing I want you to remember this is also called random access memory I will come back to this whenever I go to the next slide so this the main memory is organized as follows they have a bunch of bits meaning bit is the smallest unit rep can be represented in a computer bit is just like a one or a zero it has the value either zero or one when I put bunch of uh, ones and zeros together if I put eight of them together we call it a byte one byte if I have eight consecutive bits that's one byte so let's look at this in details why did I call it random access memory and things okay before getting there uh, in our previous class we talked about ASCII table if you look at the ASCII value like you can uh, google this uh, you can uh, search for this ASCII table online then you will come up with the huge table you will see for the letter A has the decimal value 65 so previously we learned in our introduction to computing class how to convert 65 into binary when you convert that you will get this combination 1 0 0 and 1 so inside your memory card you have bunch of microtransistors like this so they will give a electrical charge for this microtransistor and this microtransistor then it represent this number 0 1 0 0 and 1 so this number right here and this number right here is the same so this combination of microtransistors are representing what it representing letter a so if I use the powers of 2 which we learned previously 2 to the power 0 2 to the power 1 2 to the power 2 so 1 2 4 8 16 32 what is the value here for this 2 to the power 0 meaning 1 this one has a this this microtransistor has a power this microtransistor which corresponds to 64 also has a power so if I if you add 64 and 1 what do you get you get 65 which is same as this 
So this 65 and this binary numbers is equivalent. So 65 represent letter A. So if you were to write the essay, imagine how many microtransistors like this has to come on and off. So all these are happening in your main memory. Main memory has bunch of microtransistors like this. So here's a picture of that uh, memory card. They come in different size, uh, sizes and shapes. So every uh, memory card has uh, something called an address. So that's what you see in here. Think of this right here as one long street in your neighborhood. So every single one of these slot, imagine them as houses in your neighborhood. So you know every house have address. This one says cell 0, cell 1, cell 2, cell 3. Instead of we are calling them cell 1, 2, 3, we call them okay 2216 95th Street, Lubbock, Texas, something like that. Inside every slot, every cell, there are number of occupants living in them. So in this house, there might be five people living in it. This house, only one person. This house, three people. So keep, keep that concept in mind. Whenever we write program, I'm going to come back to this picture again and again and mention you. So uh, main memory is all about addresses and the content of addresses. So if you understand this concept, concept you understand addresses. So address, each byte in memory is identified by a unique number known as an address. So the cell 0, cell 1, cell 2, these are addresses. You see cell 1 here, you will not see the cell 1 being repeated down here somewhere. It's unique. There's only one cell 1. So uh, earlier I was saying main memory is random access. That's because you can randomly jump into any address, cell 1, cell 8, you know, access the content in it, meaning how many people living in this cell. So that's why we call it random. Opposed to like cassette tape or a VHS tape we used to have long time ago. If you had to go to a one portion of the movie, you have to fast forward or rewind and go to that position. You cannot just jump. But nowadays you can just jump into the whichever the place you want because we have this random access memory concept going on. Where you can jump into any cell you want and access that data. Now I'm going to take the same picture and represent it in a slightly different way. But it's still the same concept. I have the cell number and the content of each cell. So here is the same. We start with cell 0, 1, 2. These are all the slots. Since I don't have enough space to represent all of them in a one long line, I drew it like this. So notice cell 16, meaning the one with the address 16 has the value 149. So instead of number of people living in them, you know, it's just some value. Here cell 23 has 72 insert in it. Whenever you write programs, you will come up with variables like x, y, z, just like in in your math class. If you come up with the variable x and if you make this x equal 72, what's really happening inside your memory is this variable x will refer to this address 73, I mean 23. And whenever you say x equals 72, that value, since x is referring to this uh, address, cell number 23, whatever the value that you assign to it, if you assign 72, that get is stored in this box right here. Meaning like this, if you say x equals 72, that 72 get is stored in this slot. 
if you had a variable called y, y equal 149, what do you think uh, happening? So if you had y, if you say y equal 149, you know, y might have this address assigned to it, this variable. So if you say y equal 149, 149 get populated here. So whenever we write programs, I'm going to come back to this picture. If you didn't understand this right now, don't worry. I'm going to get back to it again whenever we start writing programs. So remember this concept. It's like one long street in your neighborhood. Everyone is living in a one long street and everyone have address and number of people living in them. We already talked about these two and these two. Now let's look at secondary storage. Secondary storage is this one where you load your data from here to the main memory. So the communication happening between here and here. Earlier I said main memory is volatile, but this is the opposite of main memory. This is non-volatile. Meaning, if you unplug your computer, you will not lose your data. It will still be there. Like for example, if you already save an essay that you wrote in your computer, if someone comes and unplug your computer, if it is already saved, you can turn it back on. Your, your essay will still be there. So remember, secondary storage is non-volatile. Meaning data retained when the program is not running or the computer is turned off. So the secondary storage comes in uh, various shapes and sizes. There is something called magnetic tape, the traditional hard drive. I will show you a picture of that in the next slide. You already know CDs and DVDs. These are also secondary storage devices. Like for example, if you unplug your computer while you're watching a movie on a DVD, that movie on the DVD will not go away. It will still be there. Same here, flash drives uh, or pen drive that you connect it to your USB. Also, the solid state drive. Solid state drive uses technology similar to main memory, but which is much slower. They use some uh, chips embedded in them. So, solid state drive has replaced magnetic disk, traditional magnetic hard drives. So, let's look at this magnetic hard drive, a picture of it. You might have seen this. Uh, so, if you open up that magnetic hard disk, like most old computers used to have this, that's why you see a sound whenever you open up, you try to open up something, it, this hand right here goes back and forth, this motor rotate, it try to find all the data that you saved in here. If it was a video game, it, ha it has to go through every like bunch of different places and find all those data. So you hear a sound, this hand going back and forth. So this is called the read right ha uh, hand, head. So uh, in our introduction to computer science class, we talked about these in details. Also, I showed you uh, some uh, actual unit. I opened those up and I let you guys see them. So, in the small slot sectors, you save your data. Basically, this hand is magnetized. It can be magnetized or demagnetized. So, it will go into a, one of these slots. If it magnetizes that slot, that's a one. If it demagnetize, remove that magnetism, that's going to be a zero. That's how you insert your ones and zeros. All computers deal with ones and zeros. So with the magnetic disk, you do that. So since this is very slow, this hand go, has to go back and forth. Nowadays, we have something called solid state drive. It doesn't have any mechanical parts to it only has some chips so because these have some disadvantages like if you drop it it breaks but some people 
you still use them because it's cheaper you can have larger capacities for a very low price but it can be noisy and generate heat all right so to refresh your mind on input devices i put some note in here what's an input device device that send information to the computer from outside world Many devices can provide input such as keyboards, mouse, touchscreen, digital camera, microphone. Uh, like DVDs, things like that. Output devices would be things like uh, printers, monitors meaning a screen. Some screens can be both input and output. For example, if it was a touch screen, you can provide some input by touching this screen. Also, you can get some output to it. Also, these DVDs and CDs can be both. Both input and output because you can write data to a DVD. Also, you can read from it. Keep in mind, computer is uh, what you call a computer is when you have all of these in one unit like they will have motherboard uh, the cpu memory card and secondary storage in them so if i say give me an example of an input device don't say a computer computer comprise of all of, all of those things computer of computer is a collection of things not one thing like for example if you look at baking some cookies cookies use bunch of ingredients sugar flour butter things like that if i say give me an example of sugar you should not say cookies because cookies have some other things like sh like flour and butter just like that computer itself is a collection of devices not just one unit so keep that, keep that in mind. Computer is a collection of devices. So we talked about uh, hardwares. Now let's go into software. What are softwares? Everything that happens in a computer is controlled by softwares. So, for example, if you turn on your, compu uh, in your computer or your cell phone, you know, until you turn it on to until you turn it off, it's under the control of software. Software control hardware and all the programs. So, let's look at software programs that run on a computer. There are two categories of software. One is called system software. The other one is called application software. The system software control both the hardware that we learned previously and the programs that run on them. So some example of system softwares are operating systems. What are operating systems? Operating systems like Windows 10, Windows 11, Windows 12, whatever, or the Apple operating systems. Android operating system, things like that. They manage both the hardware and the programs that run on them. Programs mean like top of Android. You might have a program like a Facebook app or a calculator app that run on them. That Android operating system also take care of its processor and memory and things like that. Then this utility programs that's also under system software meaning things like antivirus programs that check for viruses and file compression uh, programs so uh, data backup software and the other one is software developmental tool things that you that you use to develop some other software so in this class, you will use a software developmental tool called Microsoft Visual Studio. So these are some system softwares that manage hardware and programs that run on them. 
the other one is application software almost everyone is familiar with this one application software programs that provide services to the user meaning things like word processing uh, software like I was saying like app, all the apps that you see on your phone um, games programs to solve specific problems like calculators things like that those are all application software 